Okay, thank you for coming to this online event. Um, before we get started, uh, let me first acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation, of whose land our major campuses operate. Uh, I pay my full respect to the tra traditional owners of the land from wherever you are joining us. Welcome everyone uh, to the Monash Lecture Series of Behavioral Economics. I'm Xiao Jian from the Econ Department at the Monash University. Uh, this series of events is jointly organized by the Econ Department, the BET Research Group, and Mongli at the Monash Business School, and particularly by my colleagues, uh, Ayrt and Lata. Uh, we bring leading scholars in behavioral economics to give us online mini lectures talking about their frontier research. And the lecture today will take one hour and 20 minutes, followed by a 30 minute Q&A. So we allow for only clarifying questions during the lecture. For other comments and questions, we leave them in the Q&A session. And to ask questions, please raise your hand in Zoom or type in your questions in the chat box. And our graduate student, Nina Xue, will kindly help moderate the question, including reading the questions in the chat box. So this year, um, we are extremely excited to have Olan Binabu from Princeton to kick off the lecture series. Uh, I believe that Holland uh, is without any need of introduction. So he's among the top series of our time. Uh, his research spans both macroeconomics and microeconomics, and is very deep. Uh, his research agenda in behavioral economics includes, but it's not limited to economics of motivated beliefs or wishful thinking, consistently published in all top five economics journals, which all junior colleagues uh, envy a lot. Uh, it may be worth mentioning that uh, when I was a PhD student, actually not so long ago, it was actually Holland's work that motivated my interest in doing behavioral economics. And at that moment, I was obsessed with microeconomic theory. And I was not really a big fan of behavioral economics until I read Binabu and Tiho, QJE 2002. And the beauty of this line of research is that using game theory and information economics, Holland is building highly general and tractable behavioral models, and rationalizing several cognitive biases that were previously assumed to be exogenous. Uh, in other words, Holland uses the economic analysis to visit the fundamental problems uh, of human nature and behaviors, calling for reintegration uh, of insights in social sciences. I noticed that Holland is currently writing a textbook, Economics, joined with uh, Ron Tiho. And I'm pretty sure that uh, this book will become a classic reference of behavior economics for the next generation. Okay, so uh, it's really our great pleasure to have Holland uh, give the lecture today talking about beliefs and misbeliefs. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's start the lecture. So uh, Holland, the flow uh, is yours now. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Thank, thank you for the invitation to give the lecture. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, okay, so what I wanna do is start by a little bit of a brief history of, a brief and simplified history of how uh, economists have traditionally um, treated expectations or beliefs. So at some point in this, you know, until the 70s, uh, expectations were formed in a rather naive, backward looking way. The way you forecast the future was basically that it was going to look like the present or some trend extrapolation or some simple adaptive learning. Then, of course, uh, came the um, rational expectations revolution uh, in macro. And uh, in micro, um, <clears throat> again, agents were uh, extremely sophisticated now in uh, forming beliefs about the states of the world, about other people's actions. We had Bayesian equilibrium and dynamics versions and its refinements. So it was kind of the opposite extreme of uh, number one. Finally, or not finally, but uh, in the next uh, so-called generation in the 80s and 90s, the pendulum had a sharp swing again uh, with the introduction of the biases and heuristics uh, from psychology, mo most notably by Kahneman and Persky. Now, this is um, 
this is you know not necessarily the dominant way and probably not still the dominant way uh, in which uh, economists model beliefs and expectations but it's a very influential one that you can find in uh, every journal in uh, empirical work in theoretical work and so on and now to kind of oversimplify things you know agents were dumb again or at least dumb in some uh, limited but systematic ways. They were prey to base rate, neglect, base rate neglect, confirmation bias, lost small numbers, probably waiting, and a host of other uh, biases and heuristics. If you look up biases and heuristics in Wikipedia, uh, you'll find over 100 of them uh, listed there. So what I want to talk about today is another maybe more modest swing of the pendulum uh, back towards still within the realm of psychology and bounded rationality, but back towards the, the realm of, you know, some direction, some kind of purpose to the way beliefs are formed. And that is the literature on motivated beliefs, motivated reasoning, motivated cognition. There are various forms, uh, uh, various terms are used. Uh, and all of them at some point or another uh, explicitly or implicitly entail some kind of form of self-deception um, because the agent is uh, trying to manipulate not the beliefs of someone else, which is, you know, economists are very used to that, but the beliefs of themselves. And that actually encountered a lot of resistance uh, at the beginning, both from, you know, uh, traditional economics, which was very uh, wedded to number two, both in micro and even more so in macro, or still today in macro, and even from uh, number three, where um, the idea that, um, you know, these biased heuristics were more than just um, limitations of the cognitive machine, but also uh, involve emotions and desires uh, was also resisted at the beginning and still is to some extent today. So wh what are motivated beliefs or what is motivated cognition? These are beliefs or processes leading to beliefs that are uh, maybe are leveraged off of, you know, the limitations listed under three, but are directed or uh, influenced by emotional or functional value of holding certain beliefs. And of course, I will give you more many examples. And how do we recognize them? Uh, in two ways, they're resistant to evidence, but they respond to the costs and the benefits of holding certain beliefs, which we can uh, influence in experiments, and to the stakes of, you know, one state of the world or another state of the world being uh, realized for the subject. Then there are other types uh, of, of symptoms, if you will, that the beliefs are involve some kind of motivation or emotion. One of them is you might have information aversion to start with. The agent might have negative value for information. Another one is selective attention, retrieval, memory. We'll see some of that. A, th a third one is emotional responses. Instead of saying thank you for pointing out how wrong I was, the agent gets angry. Uh, when you uh, try to correct their beliefs, and uh, there are even maybe some neural signatures in the brain. So what are these uh, motivated beliefs about? Well, we can see them uh, pretty much all around them and within us. Uh, they are beliefs about the self, how talented, intelligent, uh, attractive, and especially moral I am. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm all these things about our future prospects. Are they grim or are they rosy or at least hopeful? Uh, about our identity, who do I think I am? Where do I think I belong? Again, people will have uh, often motivated beliefs about that. And then we can go in concentric circles uh, and uh, go to beliefs about how the world works. Why is it that some people are rich and others are poor? Is it effort or is it luck? Uh, is it more efficient to deliver certain goods through the state or the markets? So th this takes you uh, to ideology more generally. What, in fact, is moral or immoral? Who can be trusted and who cannot be trusted? And then, of course, religion. Uh, and more recently, we're surrounded by motivated beliefs concerning, um, you know, vaccines, conspiracies, uh, and other stuff like that. Uh, so for all of these, there's much evidence, some of which, uh, a little of which I will survey, 
that they are not formed and revised in a neutral objective manner, nor in a mechanical, in a, in a mechanically blind manner as, as in traditional biases heuristics, but that they serve either psychological needs that they help us feel good or not feel as bad or functional instrumental needs that they uh, help us uh, achieve certain goals that otherwise would be harder. So we talk, and this is a, 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 a term that we had in the paper with Jean Terol, with which of course a lot of this work has been done, of beliefs as assets, not just as signals for making the right decision, but assets that people invest in, value, defend, even when they're wrong sometimes, uh, repair, etc. So how do we know? The, the difficult thing is to know what people believe. Uh, you can't just take their word for it, if, uh, or you can't always take their word for it, if, especially if you're asking about their intelligence, their morality, uh, or uh, the proper scope of government. Um, so typically uh, what, what we do, what economists do, is to you know, elicit behaviors or at least observe behaviors uh, in, in the field and, if possible, elicit it through experiments, illicit beliefs through experiments uh, in which behavior reveals the beliefs. So before doing that, uh, or before get, getting to there, I want to talk a little bit about an example uh, of, of what proceeds, which is not an experiment, but is a very nice field study that shows uh, important evidence, or at least important uh, pointers uh, that uh, uh, some important beliefs are of this motivated form. And so some of you may already know this uh, paper by Oster et al. on uh, people who are at risk for Huntington's disease. Um, Huntington's disease is, is, a, is a terrible um, uh, neurological uh, disease. When someone gets it, they are sure to die. There is no cure, and they will die typically at the end of a very long process uh, in which their, their body uh, gradually breaks down. I've done it. Pardon? Can, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? No, OK. Uh, all right. So, and uh, the, 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 what we know about it is that if one parent has the gene variation that causes the, the disease, then there's a, the child has a 50% chance ex ante of ultimately developing it. Uh, that probably gets updated based on the symptoms by the doctors, or alternatively, it gets updated to zero of one or one uh, if you take a free and 100% accurate test. So these authors uh, followed a set of people who were at risk because uh, they had a parent uh, with the gene variation, some of which, and many of which initially were untested. And here's what we see, uh, or here's what we hear them say. Um, first of all, on the left-hand side, we see the perceived and the actual risk that the person has the disease. Um, updated by the so-called motor score, and here a higher motor score means more symptoms, uh, and so is a bad thing. So uh, <clears throat> the actual one is uh, this uh, dotted line, which starts uh, around 50%, or maybe even a bit higher than 50%, and as the motor score deteriorates, uh, goes to 100%. When you ask uh, subjects at these different motor scores what they think is the probability that they have the, belief, the disease, uh, you see that it starts at 40%. Maybe that's rational because they have no symptoms yet. And then it kind of stays uh, below 50% or 60%, no matter how bad uh, the symptoms uh, get. There's even a small fraction, I'm not sure what to make of it, who think that they have 0% of having the disease, even with very bad symptoms. Um, secondly, uh, we see here a very strong uh, information aversion. At any point, you can take the test and find out for sure. And we see that um, the share who get tested since the last visit is always very small, always below 6%. And whether you have uh, general abnormalities, possible signs, or certain signs, it gets very, very, uh, it remains very low. Okay? There's also another uh, uh, 
paper in the literature that found, this, found similar things for herpes, herpes one and two, herpes two is, is much worse than herpes one. People are willing to be tested for herpes one, but much less so for herpes two. Okay, so we see at least stated beliefs that seem out of line with reality. We see definitely an, an aversion or, or not taking up uh, uh, information that is free and possibly useful. Uh, the question is, do they act on it? Uh, or are these just things that they, that they say? So here the um, diagram shows you the behavior uh, uh, relative to people who do not have the uh, AG expansion. So for example, they took the test and the test was negative. Uh, of the people who are either are certain that they have it uh, based on symptoms or tests, or the people who are uncertain, so the one who fluctuate between 40% and 60% stated probability. And what we can see here is that when you are sure, when people are sure that they have the disease, they make drastic life changes. Uh, women are much more likely to get pregnant because later it will be too too late. There's a, an increase in divorce, an increase in retirement, uh, major financial changes, and uh, recreational changes. Now is the time to you know take that trip around the world. Uh, People who are uncertain, so who state uh, probabilities between 40% and 50%, basically behave exactly as they were sh as if they were sure that they do not have the disease. There's basically no change in pregnancy, retirement, divorce, or anything else. Okay, so um, so it's not just that people uh, don't get the information to update their beliefs, that they, that they state beliefs that don't update, it's that they act on uh, as if they had these non-updated beliefs. And then we see that also, of course, we've seen this for COVID, people who are uh, in complete denial that they have it, even at the point where they are dying from it. Okay, but this was not experimental. Uh, and so we'll get to experiments. Before that, I want to uh, provide a little um, theoretical organizing framework to think about the determinants and the motives, I guess, of these uh, belief distortions. So I'll take a little theoretical detour based on some of the work that I, I have done uh, with, Jean, with Jean and also later on by myself. So simple unifying framework. Um, and then uh, we'll look at uh, a, a set of, um, of tests of the predictions, both in the lab, and uh, this should not be from the lab, it should be from the field. Then hopefully I'll have time to talk about how we go from individual belief distortions to collective belief distortions like groupthink. Um, and again, evidence from the lab, and if uh, there is time, evidence from the field and probably I won't have time to talk about religion. Okay, so here's um, just, just quickly on this one because I've, I've, I've already kind of previewed it. Um, um, there's gonna be uh, a variant of the model that's based on the hedonic value of beliefs as Schelling described it, the mind is a consuming organ who likes to have certain beliefs and not others. And there's a variant that's based on the functional value of beliefs that help with self-control or motivation, or also if you believe it, it's easier to convince others. Okay, This is what we call the demand side. These are reasons why people might want to depart from objective beliefs. How do they do that? Um, this is what we call the supply side. Uh, as we saw before, the first one way is to not get signals uh, to start with. Another one is to distort the signals that you get or the way you process them by distorting your attention, your interpretation, your recall. Memory will be important uh, in various ways. Okay. And as I mentioned before, this is gonna be very different from what I call mechanical biases and heuristics because the emotions and desires are going to be involved in the why and when you change the stakes of this uh, why, uh, either the economic or the psychological stakes, you can see how the beliefs and the behaviors change. Another way that we know it's not just you know, uh, 
limitations of the brain is that very often more cognitively sophisticated or educated people are not worse or uh, have equally distorted beliefs or sometimes even more distorted beliefs than uh, 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 people with lower IQ or education. Okay, so here's what I call this simple unifying framework. I'm going to show you the two versions uh, in succession. So here is um, a three simple three period model. In period one, uh, an agent takes an action zero one. The cost is C. In period two, a final period, there's some uh, payoff, utility payoff that depends on the action that's been taken. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the cost uh, maybe, and uh, some unknown state of the world theta, think of it as talent or, you know, was this a good project or something like that. Uh, and uh, that's what we call UI2. Now in this version of the model, uh, the mo reason to not have uh, objective beliefs about theta is that it can help motivate you. So uh, the simplest way to formalize that is that the agent uh, uh, has a hyperbolic discounting or some other type of temptation in period one. So they, are, um, they know that they are likely to put in uh, excessively low effort. What do you do? Well, if you can bind yourself, uh, commit yourself, you will do that. But often it's not uh, easy, especially if we're talking about your efforts as opposed to your effort, as opposed to saving. And so another way to do it is to kind of overstate the return to effort, if that is what theta is. And uh, in that case, uh, you will trade off the possible mistakes of investing or exerting effort when you shouldn't versus the way in which it corrects your tendency to underinvest. So that's uh, the why here. And then the how uh, comes in period zero. Okay, so initially the agent gets a signal about the project value, let's say the return to effort or return to investment. Um, and uh, this could be a good signal, uh, a green flag H, or a bad signal, a red flag L, which normally should say, well, don't invest, it's not worth it, or maybe it's even dangerous. Uh, for the reasons that we explained, the agent typically will take, uh, you know, process correctly a good signal, but when they have a bad signal, they might try to reinterpret it selectively, uh, forget it, etc., and transform it into either uh, a, a good signal or something in between, which is why this H is, is brown, or just no signal, just forget that they saw the bad news. Okay. Uh, another thing you could do is to just not get any signal initially if you think your priors are initially sufficiently good. Uh, there's a nice quotation here from William James, the, one of the founding fathers of psychology, uh, that expresses exactly that, that you, want to you may want to believe what is in the line of your needs because only by such belief is the need fulfilled and your feet are nerved to its accomplishment. I just love the way he writes. Okay, next uh, version of this, but, but really they're, they're close cousins, uh, is anticipatory feelings uh, uh, or uh, self-esteem or sometimes called ego utility. There's only one thing that's gonna be changed is the why, the, the, the motive. Okay, so again, an action taken at zero one, a final payoff that depends on the action and some unknown state of the world or, 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 or ability variable. No distortion to effort here, but a consumption value of beliefs. In period one, the agent will think about or, or reflect upon what they're likely to get in period two, uh, terrible sickness or not, uh, getting fired or not, and being successful in their career or not. And uh, so they form this expectation E1 of UI2 and enters their utility of flow payoff S times this, S for savoring um, or uh, something like that, okay? So now there's a consumption reason to uh, make yourself you know, feel good or not feel uh, despaired to have relatively positive views of UI2, which may involve positive views of theta and again, uh, you're going to trade that against uh, the fact that this would lead to mistakes. And then on the 
how to get their side, it's exactly the same uh, formalism, either complete signal aver uh, avoidance, or if you get signals, you selectively process them. Okay, here's a, a, a quotation, which I apologize in French from Marcel Proust, but basically is saying, is, is saying how, you know, he's trying to replace bad memories with good imagination or imagination of hopeful things. Okay, so in one case or the other, okay, clearly uh, there's a trade-off which, uh, you know, comes out of the model without writing equations, we can picture it. I'm plotting here this savoring parameter or the weight of anticipatory feeling. We could also say that S is susceptibility to hope and, and anxiety, hope and fear. And here, the degree of realism of the individual. So what is realism? It's the probability that when you get a signal L, you remain aware of it and you correctly act on it. Uh, and denial is the opposite, that you transform it into an H or that you just uh, erase it from your, um, from your awareness. Okay? Uh, so clearly when S is zero, we have the standard uh, model. The agent always wants to be fully realist up to this point. Now starts the trade-off. They're willing to become a little bit less realist because of the uh, anticipatory consumption value. And then beyond this point, they are just in complete denial. We can also replace, as should be clear from the previous slides, this weight of anticipatory feelings by the weakness of will, one over beta. And so similarly, if you have perfect willpower, you want to be a realist. And then as your willpower decreases, you might want to uh, follow the precepts of William James and, uh, and, and, and believe in what, you know, what, what is needed to believe. Okay, so that's, uh, that's you know, a simple uh, uh, prediction, kind of prediction comes out of it. Uh, asymmetric updating for good versus bad news. Uh, so we'll want to look at evidence on biased uh, response to good and bad news, maybe specifically through biased recall and, and uh, um, or ex ante information avoidance. We'll want to look at uh, evidence of that. And we will, you know, uh, want to look at comparative statics prediction, namely, are we likely more likely to see biased beliefs or willful uh, blindness? for the decisions where the model says we should see them, namely where the cost of mistakes is smaller. Uh, a good example is voting. Uh, voting, if you get it wrong, the, uh, if you get your political beliefs wrong and your vote wrong, uh, the costs are relatively low uh, individually. Uh, but of course, if everybody does it, that has big implications. Issues on which the final resolution is far into the future so that you get to uh, enjoy consumption value of beliefs or you get to motivate yourself for many periods before a potential mistake is, is revealed and has to be paid for. Task in which perseverance is more of an issue. And this is important, fixed or long lasting forms of capital. If you just motive, you know, distort your beliefs about something that's very transitory, it's not uh, worth a lot. But if it's about something that's long lasting, then it is worth a lot or it can be worth a lot. Similarly for illiquid assets. This is what I call stakes dependent beliefs. If you had fixed stakes that you cannot divest from and these stakes are long lasting, you're more likely to have distorted beliefs about the payoffs uh, uh, or the realization of those stakes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip that um, and go directly to evidence. Uh, so I'll start with a couple of papers that are, uh, I wouldn't say they're old, but, but they're, they're out there in the literature. And then I will focus on some more uh, very recent papers. So one of the first papers to test this was this so, in stage one, we can Okay. 
you. Yeah, Roland, we cannot hear you very well. You cannot hear me very well all of a sudden. Oh, now it's a bit better. There were quite statics up. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, let me repeat in case. Uh, so first we collect, uh, we rank subjects by IQ or by attractiveness to the opposite sex or randomly. Stage two. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, can you hear uh, me? Here, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, actually, uh, yeah, um, the voice is uh, now clear. It seems yeah. that there are lots of problems on Zoom today because I cannot. Turn. No, not very well. Hi, Roland, we can't hear you very well. Sorry. Try something else for the. There we oh, go. The, it's fixed for now. For the sound. Let me try oh, something else. Good. It is good? Yeah, yes. no, it's good. Yeah. It's good. Thanks. Yeah. Strange. Okay. All right. Um, if you okay. could uh, repeat the slide, I think we just lost you yep. from the beginning of the slide. Right. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to test this prediction or this mechanism of asymmetric updating uh, based on this paper. Um, and uh, the beliefs are going to be about the self. So subjects are going to be uh, ranked by the experimenters based on IQ or attractiveness to the other gender or some random number. Then we ask them to state their prior beliefs uh, if we're being in each of the 10 deciles, and this is incentivized, they have to bet on where they are. <clears throat> These prior beliefs, maybe everybody thinks they're in the top, you know, three deciles, but we don't know what they know. So there's no, there's no test specifically on the prior beliefs. The tests are gonna be on the updating. Two rounds of updating. Uh, in each round, a person learns if they rank above or other or below some other randomly uh, anonymous uh, selected anonymous subject. If they know that they, if they're told that they rank above, they should, you know, give themselves a better rank the next time. And conversely, if they are told that they rank below. And so they state twice their updated belief about which decile they're in. And again, it's incentivized. They have to bet. Uh, and at the end of the experiment, we elicit their willingness to learn or not learn their true rank, namely uh, they can pay to learn exactly where they are in the distribution, or they can pay to learn to not learn where they are. So um, what is it that um, don't necessarily look at the, at, the, at the paper, just go to the, uh, at the graph, it's in the paper. What I wanna emphasize are the, the results. We see that people update close to Bayes' rule for positive signals, signals that you know, say good things. They under update for negative signals, but only when it's about intelligence or especially beauty, these are students, uh, young people, and not at all when it's about a random rank. Secondly, at the end, when they have arrived at relatively optimistic beliefs about their rank, they're willing to pay to find exactly what it is. When they have arrived at relatively pessimistic beliefs about their rank, they're willing to pay to avoid finding what it is. Okay. Um, and uh, these beliefs are very different from standard confirmatory bias in which, you know, you, if you think that you're not good, you should look for signals that confirm that you're not good. Uh, we definitely don't see that. Uh, there's another paper that finds similar results. Uh, so basically, this was the first or one of the first papers to show these two or to test these two predictions of asymmetric uh, updating response to good and bad news and uh, negative value of information. Okay, now I want to move to a completely different domain from the self to the world uh, and specifically to politics. Uh, based on this paper by Michael Thaler, who was on the market this year, a very nice paper, I think. So we're going to uh, uh, let, let X be some objective number that's again, as before, is either loaded, uh, potentially loaded, like what's your relative IQ or in this, or here we're gonna be focused a lot on 
Did employment uh, went, go up or down during Obama's administration or crime go up or down during some gun law, et cetera? Or it could be a neutral number like about you know, the length of the river or something like that. Uh, we're going to ask, and, and you know, if it's relative IQ, then it's very close to the previous experiment. So the not, one part of the novelty is that this is about political beliefs. We're going to elicit, elicit each subject's initial median belief, and median is important about X. Okay, so we ask them to guess their guess G, such that they put equal probability on the truth uh, X being greater than G and 50% on X less than G. Formally, it means, you know, what's the G that where you're equally willing to bet on either of these two events? Okay, and then we do that for, you know, various uh, types of Xs. Next, the subject is going to receive a message, some news that says X is above your guess or X is below your guess. Okay. And it is known from the start and explained to the students that with probably 50%, that message comes from the computer source that always states the truth and with 50% from one that always lies. And then we elicit two things. One, which is also novel, is what is your probability assessment that the message you received uh, was fake versus real news, i.e. came from the computer that always lies or the one that always states the truth? And then, you know, what's your updated median belief G prime about X? So here, uh, you know, the latter is a little bit like in the previous experiment, and this one asks specifically about the reliability of the news source. There's another also a variant where you get both a message that says X is greater than X than G, and one that says it's smaller, and you have to bet on which ones is more likely to be true. Now the this allows us to see how people assess the reliability of news that are either real or fake, depending on whether they align or contradict their motivations. And here the motivations are going to be primarily political. And then how they revise their beliefs in response to real or fake news based on their motivations. Okay, And this is a very sharp test because for a Bayesian, and even for a Bayesian who suffers from most common uh, biases heuristics, there's absolutely nothing to infer from the message you get. That is, the def by definition, if G is your uh, median belief, you're equally likely, you know, the truth is equally likely to be above or below. So if you get a message that with 50% chance is likely to be true or false, telling you that it's above or below, you should update neither on the reliability of the source nor on the state X itself. Okay. And so the first thing we see is that in the experiment, which was done online, when X is about a neutral issue like geography, subjects don't update much about source veracity or the question at hand. Okay, so they behave as if they understand that there's not much information in the message. Now we want to look at what happens when X is a sensitive, loaded political issue. So, and, and, and people have different motives to, to believe that X is, is a big number or a small number. So here are the topics. Uh, crime, upward mobility, racial discrimination, climate change, gun reform, et cetera, et cetera. The motives, the presumed motives are that crime got better under Obama. If you're a pro-Democrat, got worse under Obama. Uh, refugees decrease violent crime, increase violent crime, et cetera, et cetera. So the design of the experiment is that after you know, eliciting some demographics, including whether you identify as a Democrat or Republican, we're going to ask you a question one in, oops, in random order. Maybe it'll be about racial discrimination. Uh, and we'll ask you, you know, what's your best guess about this measure of racial discrimination? Or what's your best guess about crime under Obama? And so on. And give us your G. Then the computer tells you, you were uh, the truth is above or below. And then we ask you, uh, do you think this was real news or fake news? And tell us again uh, your best guess about crime under Obama or, uh, or uh, you know, homicides following gun reform. Hopefully uh, it's clear. So what we see here is uh, a test of what I call these stakes dependent beliefs. Uh, clearly, if you're a Republican, you presumably have uh, emotional uh, and maybe even you know, self-esteem self stakes in thinking 
kind of Republican things, and conversely, if you're a Democrat. So on this graph, we see that um, the, what's the probability that the truth that that news that they got uh, that what what probably they assess that the that the news they got are true, depending on whether the 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 message the news was anti-party or pro-party. Okay, so anti-party would be uh, let's say you're a Democrat. Uh, we asked you your best guess of crime under Obama, and then we told you it was actually higher than you, your guess. Okay, so that's anti-party news. If we say it's actually lower, and we also always say true things, of course, uh, that's um, um, uh, pro-party news, but the subjects don't know uh, whether it's true uh, or not because it comes from these random sources. So here we see that uh, clearly, uh, relative to the mean, uh, people uh, distrust uh, news sources that give them anti-party uh, messages uh, especially if they are partisan uh, Democrats or Republicans, uh, and uh, still if they're moderate ones, uh, so these have higher stakes than those. And then if they're pro, and the news are pro-party, then we think these must be true news, not fake news, uh, and especially even more so if uh, we are partisans, uh, uh, that is not just leaning Democrat or Republican, but we identify as Democrat or Republican. Okay, and then you can see here, uh, similarly by comparing the two PDFs, that basically if news are anti-party, they tend to be qualified as fake news. If they're pro-party, they tend to be classified as real news. Uh, again, um, I won't go into the details, but these kind of unmotivated confirmation bias, based neg neglect, et cetera, cannot account for the results. Uh, and uh, be, again, because it's contrary to the previous experiment, it's not that you're updating more or less uh, uh, than that, uh, that you're updating in a, a different way than a Bayesian in one or the other direction. A Bayesian shouldn't update at all. Um, and, um, and in fact, you are updating systematically uh, in the direction of your uh, favorite party. We can break it down by topic because you know there are lots of subjects and it remains significant. You can see that on all of these issues, except whether the media is biased, there's a significant effect of motivated reasoning. Namely, if the news are pro-party, I think more likely to think that they are, are come from the true source. If they are anti-party, uh, anti-my party, I'm more likely to think that they come from the fake source. Okay. Um, so for eight out of nine political issues, uh, the more partisan, the more so, that's the stakes dependence. Over here we see, and it's a good, um, it's, it's a good uh, sanity check. This is not about politics. This is about your own performance on an IQ test. So very consistent with the previous one. And we find that as well, but only for men, uh, which might perhaps explain why men are typically more overconfident than women. And then following these, you know, self-serving or, or uh, motivated assessments about the reliability of the source, people do, quote unquote, follow the message. Uh, namely, uh, if you think the source well, if the source aligned with your, you know, your wishes, then you're going to believe it and you're going to update X in that direction and not if it, di if it disagreed with uh, your motivations. Okay, so... Um, that's another very nice experiment. So I want to mention, even though uh, it's going to be well known over there, uh, this other very nice experiment, which was the first to test the the memory channel, which uh, was you know was was kind of the way we formalized it in the model, that we don't have to take memory always uh, literally. It can be attention. It can be awareness. Um, so, and I want to emphasize, you know, also how all these experiments build on each other and, and build on the models and the models build on the experiments. So here we have subjects come in, they answer questions from an IQ test, which again is incentivized. Two months later, they're called back, they show the same four questions, plus two that they had never seen, and they also show the answers. And they ask to recall for each question, uh, did you... Uh, uh, see this question and answer it cor correctly, incorrectly, or may, or did you not see it, or you can't remember, and here are the incentives. 
So there are eight possible types of uh, recall errors, which uh, the authors call amnesia. So uh, you, you saw the question, uh, you, you got it right or you got it wrong, but you say that, uh, that you didn't see it, okay? Confabulation, there's a bit of a uh, mess in the notation. This would be S to S prime means, for example, you got it right, but you recall that you got it wrong. That's gonna be pretty rare. Or you got it wrong and you recall that you got it right. And delusion, uh, somehow there's a, uh, delusion means that in fact you had never seen, so empty set, you hadn't seen this question. We say, yes, I remember and I got it right or I got it wrong. And so we're gonna test uh, whether people show these memory distortions and whether they are uh, you know, directionally uh, different in the direction of you know, presumed motivation to think that I'm a smart person. And the answer is clearly yes. Uh, this is for uh, you know, saying that you don't remember a question uh, that you did take. If, uh, and you can see that the bars for, um, let me see, um, Let me, let me start here, uh, first of all, because that's the most striking. This is uh, the set of people, this is a fraction of people who got a question right and remember that they got it wrong. And this is for each question. And this is the set of the fraction who got it, um, uh, who, who got do the opposite, namely they got it wrong and they say that uh, they got it right, okay? And this is, uh, wrong and you say that you remember you don't remember seeing the question this is that you got the question right and you don't remember uh seeing the question again Apollo, uh, it seems that your voice is now clear again uh, is it only my wife my, oh, voice? my problem okay. i don't know whether it's only my problem or... right, let me try let me try one thing let me try to get rid of my uh earphones and maybe that's the problem just give me a minute. Uh, how is it now? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can. Better? Better. Okay, all right, sorry about that. So uh, could you hear when I explain these two first diagrams or not? Yeah, no, no, it's clear. No, it's very clear. Right, but do I need to explain them again? Again, or, or... By, the, by the way, Roland, uh, I have a, a very minor point. Uh, yeah. th thank you uh, for discussing this paper. Uh, this is really nice. Uh, actually, we have some uh, updated results in the final uh, published yeah. work. So it's actually more than 600 subjects. So we include both Singapore and Beijing subjects. I see, uh, I see. More than okay. thousand subjects. Yeah. But the key results right. are there. Yeah, just Even better, there. yes. Thank and you. the title is also, also called uh, Motivated Force Memory. So we also have a uh, yes, yes, yes. All right. Yeah, that's it. That's My fault. I should have updated. Thank you for pointing it out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for it. Yeah. And uh, right. And then finally, this uh, this is the fraction of people who um, who remember. There's a question that they actually didn't see, but they say, "I remember seeing it, and I got it wrong." Uh, basically, nobody. And this is the fraction who say, "I remember seeing it, and I got it right," and it's pretty high. Okay, so these were lab experiments. Now I want to go to the so-called real world and you will see how this other uh, experiment builds on, the, uh, you know, on, on these other two. Uh, it's about managers in, uh, in a chain uh, um, uh, of food and beverage stores, which is anonymous. Each of them uh, is compensated uh, by bonuses or importantly compensated by bonuses um, every quarter, the firm runs tournaments, uh, both regional and national, and uh, people are ranked and based on their rank, their performance, they will get a bonus that can be up to 100, 150% of their base salary, 50% um, uh, of monthly income. This is the way business is done normally in that firm. So uh, people have been doing that for many quarters they understand very well the performance criteria. 
uh, they know who their competitors are, et cetera. So in a sense, it, it's, uh, it has a lot of uh, ecological validity, whereas, you know, you're, you know, ranking yourself on beauty, performance, these, uh, remembering these IQ tests, this might be a little bit weird uh, to uh, subjects who've never seen them. In fact, research observed 31 quarters of performance and feedback. They have a lot of information. So we can manage uh, measure managers' beliefs, so they're at least their predictions, of their next quarter performance and again incentivize them. We ask them what's the most likely quintile of the tournament in which you think you'll be uh, next, um, next quarter. And we can also uh, measure their recall. We say, what was your performance in the previous quarter? Um, and uh, this one is very interesting because you know there's no there's no uh, there's no point in 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 lying to the experimenter to look good. The experimenter looks exact knows exactly what your performance was last quarter and maybe for the past you know thirty quarters. And then we can measure individual characteristics of the managers. So uh, what do we see? Uh, we see, first of all, a lot of overconfidence about future, namely uh, uh, fourth quarter of that year performance. Uh, over here um, are the actual, um, the quintiles for actual performance. And here are the predicted performance above the diagonal. These are the people who are overconfident. And below the diagonal, these are people who are underconfident. You see there's much more overconfidence than underconfidence. Uh, relative to actual performance. But perhaps, you know, how would they know about their actual performance? Uh, let's compare instead uh, their prediction to the best prediction you could make based on past data. So given all the, the data that we have about each manager, what would be uh, the prediction from a, a, a simple but flexible Bayesian model? And how do their uh, forecasts compare to that? And here again, we see by about the same amount, much more overconfidence than under, sorry, much more overconfidence. I, I should not have showed pointed here. Overconfidence is about twice as frequent as underconfidence. Okay, so uh, overconfidence or positive uh, thinking. Uh, what about memory? So here we ask uh, people's uh, reported rank in the previous quarter, second quarter, uh, of 2015, and we compare it to their actual rank. Okay. Um, and uh, you can see uh, clearly that most of the people are above the diagonal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, there's a positive correlation. Am I breaking up again? Hello? No, it's good. It's good. Good? OK. Yeah, everything's good. All right. All right. So you can see that there's a lot of weight above the diagonal. So people have rosy memories of their performance just last quarter, which uh, again, you know, uh, in, a, in a familiar activity. Uh, and it's especially true uh, for people who have the worst rank. Um, and so uh, we can see that we have, uh, again, this kind of uh, uh, um, biased memory. And finally, um, um, and, and importantly, forgetting is more, um, finally, the predictions about the future are related to the recall past performance. That is, it is, there's a strong correlation between how rosy is my recall of last quarter's performance and how rosy is my forecast of next quarter, of my performance next quarter. Okay. So we can almost see reality denial based on, you know, um, distorted memories in action. It's the people, typically the people who do poorly, who uh, overestimate how, um, how well they did or, un, you know, uh, uh, are, are unrealistic about how poorly they did. And then from that, they take, uh, they make rosy forecasts. Okay. Now, what we don't have here, or we don't have a good measure of, although the, 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 the paper uh, looks a little bit at it, um, is you know, how, how do these beliefs uh, translate into actions? Uh, what they seem is that people with uh, over-optimistic beliefs tend to, um, tend to behave in different ways, uh, not necessarily in Pareto dominant ways. They do better in some ways and uh, worse in other ways. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Because I've lost track here. 
Can somebody give me an indication? Uh, you have uh, 20, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, okay. Yeah. All right, this is gonna be a very similar experiment, again, from someone who was uh, on the market this year from Berkeley, I believe. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's about fertility in uh, Kenya. It's part of a, a, a bigger, much bigger study uh, uh, on Kenya, but in this module, people were asked when they were about 22, uh, <clears throat> first of all, how many children do you have, F2, F for fertility, and uh, if you could choose exactly how many children in total would you like yourself or your partner to give birth, um, so you know, what's your uh, fertility desire for your whole lifetime, X2. Okay, and then also kind of a control question about the vice president of Kenya. And then we revisit them uh, 11 years later, more, uh, more, um, more or less, or 10 years later, and we count the actual number of living children, F4, and their fertility desires, how many children do you want to have in total during your life, including the ones you have, and this is important, your recall fertility desires. We asked you back then, first time we interviewed you, how many children did you say you would like to give birth to? And um, please tell us, you know, what you said then. Okay, and then we can either uh, give them uh, monetary incentives to recall accurately or not. Okay, but we elicit their memory of their initial plans. And we can also ask them uh, at the end of the experiments: Would you like us to remind you? how many children you said you would want uh, during your whole lifetime. Um, and we'll even offer you money uh, to, to give you that information. And we do the same with a, a vice president. Please name who was the vice president uh, you know, during the, the wave uh, of 2007 and 2009. So very nice design. We have a recall, we have uh, projections you know, or desires at least and we have recall desires. And the tables, uh, you know, just visually, they look, uh, although they're slightly different, they look very much uh, similar to, or they show things very much similar to the other one. At the age 22, the average desired lifetime number of children is 3.3. By 32, it is already 4.0. So they have changed how many children uh, they want in their life. Uh, and they have still many years of fertility left, so probably they'll end up with more than four. So may maybe they, you know, maybe they just found out that children are great and they want even more. However, what you know calls into question uh, this this interpretation is that uh, when you ask them to recall uh, how many children they wanted when they were 22, well, they their recall is biased upward. Okay? It's kind of a weighted average between what they said at the time and where they are now. Uh, and this is especially true for people you know, who have many more children uh, than they said they would. Okay? Uh, as you can see uh, on this um, graph, um, you, uh, which, which shows here the, you know, the, the actual past desired number of children, the ones that they say they recall, and as the number of children you know, grows and exceeds how many they wanted, uh, they, uh, their recalled desire uh, go up as well. They kind of rationalize uh, the number of children they, that they have, uh, which is not what they initially wanted. And you can see that for women and you can see that even stronger for men. So uh, a rough rule of thumb is that, you know, what you recall is about 40% of, you know, your actual plan at the time and 60% exposed how it turned out. And this is especially true for those who have uh, a lot of excess fertility. Uh, we can give them incentives. Uh, and uh, when we give them incentives to remember uh, the, you know, the vice president, uh, those incentives work. When we give them incentives to recall their past fertility desires, if they have no excess fertility, um, those incentives work. If they have excess fertility, meaning that they already have more, uh, significantly more children than they said they would, then even with incentives, they don't recall any better. Um, I'm going to skip that just for um, just for uh, just 
uh, to go ahead. Okay, so this was about individual uh, belief distortions. Uh, we saw, uh, you know, so, um, uh, asymmetric updating. We saw information aversion. We saw uh, selective uh, recall and, and its link with uh, uh, bias forecasts. Now I want to go to uh, collective beliefs uh, uh, at the group or at the uh, even larger level. And uh, let's start. Yeah. In, in yeah. that uh, um, test then in Kenya, did they actually have access then to fertility controls? So I'm just thinking that that may well bias it and that they may not actually have direct control over their fertility. Um, so the quick answer is, I don't know if they had access to contraception, I guess you mean. Um, that would, uh, that might explain why they, uh, that either that or, you know, I just love children more than I thought might explain why uh, they end up with many more children than they had planned. It would not explain why they remember having more children, wanting more children than they actually wanted. Um, so, um, but uh, the answer, the, the specific answer to your question is in the paper, but I forgot it. Uh, it's probably varying, uh, you know, across across. And these are farmers. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So now on to groups. So uh, you know, as kind of motivation for this, I want to uh, uh, quote a number of of, of uh, sentences from official reports, uh, and also sometimes from the media, and also from economists, in which certain terms appear for which uh, my sense was at the time, we don't have a model, we don't know exactly what this means, okay? So Columbia and also Challenger disaster, optimistic organizational thinking, what, what is that? It's an organization that's thinking optimistically like we saw these individuals think optimistically, but it happens at the level of the organization. Uh, this is about um, uh, the financial crisis. Merrill was um, colorblind in a sea of red flags. I like the, 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 that sentence. General Motors was one of decline and denial. What does it mean that a company is in denial? Decline, we know, but denial, what is it? Uh, and then you can look it up, uh, you know, uh, also for the regulators, you find similar um, things about ignoring red flags. Um, Schiller talks about new economic era thinking, <clears throat> and Reinhard Rogoff uh, uh, write that the ability of governments and investors to delude themselves, um, giving rise to euphoria that ends in tears, etc., seems to have remained a constant. But what is it that governments, you know, governments and investors who delude themselves? Uh, what exactly does it mean? That's typically not a rational agent. That's not even an agent with uh, you know, poor information, nor an agent uh, with standard biases and heuristics. Uh, they just deluding themselves. So uh, what I did in this paper on groupthink, uh, which I want to again quickly uh, uh, sketch and then um, use to introduce some recent tests of collective memory, uh, sorry, collective uh, belief distortions. Um, is the following. So let's take exactly the same model as before. And here, let's take the, uh, you know, the consumption value of beliefs version, the anticipatory feelings version. And we're going to make these agents uh, interdependent uh, in the simplest possible way. The payoff to agent I is going to be a linear combination of their efforts and the average effort of others multiplied by the value of the project. Uh, you, you know, will the rocket succeed or blow up? Will the housing market uh, boom or eventually collapse? And so on, okay? Um, <clears throat> is our president sane or crazy and so on, okay? And notice here, there's no strategic interaction between efforts, there's no complementarity or substitutability. This is just a standard linear public goods problem. What it does mean, however, is that the, what I call the stakes are endogenous. You know, my, my stakes in theta turning to be high or low, okay, are going to be influenced by whether 
what people do, other people do, and therefore also by what other people believe uh, in the high and in the low states, uh, what, how they pay attention to red flags or not. Uh, and so we can now ask uh, whether beliefs are uh, contagious or not. Um, okay. So there are two cases uh, which I tried to uh, um, explain intuitively. Okay. Suppose that this is kind of what I call a low risk project, uh, a team effort, something that's always a public good. So what it means is that even in the low state, even when theta is low, it's still positive, positive relative to what else we could do with our efforts, such as getting the hell out of there. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, if others uh, persevere in spite of bad news, that's good for me. Okay? That raises my payoff. Their EI is multiplied by a positive theta relative to the outside value. And so the reality is easier to accept. Sure, it's not the first best where theta would be high. It is actually fairly low, but at least there are people who are still providing public goods. And so that makes it easier to face this reality. So if I trace here the same plot as we had before, uh, linking the weight of anticipatory feelings or susceptibility to fear and hope and the optimal degree of realism in a, of an individual, uh, we had this black curve here. And now I insert this individual into a group context where their payoffs depends also on what others do and therefore on what others believe. And we can see that if others are in denial, then the bad state is not as bad. And so I'm more willing to tolerate that it is the, the bad state. And so the whole diagram shifts towards realism. Conversely, if in the low state, people who you know, remain blind and keep uh, forging ahead, create negative externalities or high risks for others, bankruptcy, uh, rocket blows up, we go to jail, global warming, and so on, that means uh, formally that the theta here is negative, again, negative to whatever else we could be doing with our efforts, uh, some outside option value. And so when other people put in uh, effort or keep investing in this project that now has a negative return, that makes it even worse for me. Okay? Even if I abstain from investing, they're investing and they're gonna hurt me. Uh, my fate is tied to theirs. So uh, the thing works in reverse. Uh, if I insert an individual into an organization or a group where others are in denial and the de denial makes the bad news even worse, then the bad news become even more scary and uh, denial becomes even more tempting. Okay, that's what I call um, the, the mad or mutually assured delusion principle, a very perverse uh, result in some sense, which says that when reality avoid denial or avoidance by others is beneficial, it is in fact self-dampening. If others delude, then I'm happy to you know, face the reality. And it's when it's harmful that it's going to be contagious uh, because again, we're not in a third, second best now, we're in a third best situation and that's just too scary to, to comprehend. So based on these results, we can now look for an equilibrium where everybody's beliefs about a common reality uh, adapt to those of others and vice versa. And um, basically what we do is trace out on each of these um, graphs, the set of points uh, red where you know, my belief is the best response to others' beliefs. And uh, we see that in the first case, we get our group morale, the equilibrium in this red curve. And uh, there's some intermediate degree of delusion, but not enough because delusion in some sense, I should say group morale is, is good for the group. And in the other case, because the diagram moves in the other direction and beliefs are complement, uh, we see that uh, in fact, you can get multiple equilibria uh, or in this range. If everyone else is a realist, then it's optimal to be a realist. If everyone else is, a, is in denial, then I want to be in denial too, because the reality is, is, is just terrible, uh, made terrible by other people's denials, and it's not something that I can escape. Note here again the role of you know, illiquid assets or fixed stakes or not being able to, to get away. 
Okay, so both collective realism and collective denial can coexist as organizational or corporate cultures. Um, this more likely when they're more uh, people are more independent, exit is difficult. It's also more, uh, the model predicts. I haven't shown the formula. It's more likely when uh, bad events, theta L, when they occur are really bad, but they are relatively rare. And then we can think about not just a horizontal group, but a hierarchy uh, or country with a leader at, its, at their top. And the intuition says that, you know, um, my optimal beliefs or my best response, you know, depends on what people who really have a lot of weight in my utility over here. Um, everyone had the same weight in my utility, but there's somebody who has a big weight in my final utility what they do and therefore what they think is going to really uh, matter for you know, whether I want to think that theta is high or theta is low. And so uh, the result here is that we're gonna get, oops, we're gonna get um, um, that uh, beliefs trickle down and in particular delusions trickle down in hierarchies. Other examples are climate change denial, fatalism about poverty and so on. Okay, so what I want to do now is show one or two recent papers that uh, test uh, this kind of um, um, collective distortion of beliefs that, that can happen more so in a group than uh, individual. Okay. So this recent paper by uh, Opri and Yuxel, Social Exchange of Motivated Beliefs, uh, says it all. It's, it brings us back to the, to the lab. Uh, with a familiar format, people take IQ tests, then they're assigned to either the green or the red group. And there are two treatments. In the motivation treatment, the green group is those with a uh, uh, IQ score above the median, red is below median. So you'd like to, you don't know which group you are, but you would rather be, you know, think that you're in the green group than in the red group. In the no motivation treatment, you get 50-50 chance of being assigned to green or red. Then in, uh, the experiment proceeds as follows. Uh, during 44 seconds, uh, each uh, subject provides their own estimate of the probability that they're in the green or red group using a slider. So you can see here my estimates, you put the slider where you want, and this is incentivized. Then after 45 seconds, uh, if you are in the exchange treatment, um, so you're gonna be paired with another subject who is in the same group as you, okay? And from there on, you also see the partner's estimation slider. So, you know, you have the same theta, uh, at least in terms of, of, of groups, okay? And they have their estimate, you have their estimate, and you see both of them. And you can move your cursor, they can move your cursor, and again, it's incentivized, okay? Um, and then at the end, there's a public signal, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So what do we see? Um, we see here, uh, particularly for the people who have uh, actual low IQ, which the experimenters know, but and also for those who have high IQ, but less so, we see uh, two things. In the first phase, when you're just by yourself, the beliefs quickly stabilize and are the same under exchange, which is um, the, the, the continuous line and under no exchange, which is the dotted line. Um, and, you know, so some people become optimistic, uh, some people become pessimistic, okay, and their cursor stabilized. At 45 seconds is when you're put in a group with someone who, you know, is in the same IQ category as you, and uh, you exchange uh, your beliefs. You can see what they believe, they can see what you believe. And what we see here is that, you know, when you're optimistic, uh, there's very little change. When you're pessimistic, the group or the pair, I should say, becomes much less pessimistic, okay? They convince each other, so to speak, when they exchange their beliefs, uh, when they communicate their beliefs, that they're actually much better than they are compared to if you stay by yourself in a no exchange group, well, then you're gonna stay where you are, where you were. And we see it here uh, for the haiku group as well, but less strong. So. Um, social exchange causes subjects' beliefs to partially converge. Uh, 
most importantly, convergence is highly asymmetric in two ways, uh, which we can see here. Okay, adjustment is systematically uh, upwards uh, rather than downwards. Uh, and it's especially driven by relatively pessimistic subject who move towards their optimistic counterparts. The optimists don't update based on, you know, having a pessimistic counterpart. Uh, and it is strongest for those in the low IQ group. Okay? In the no motivation condition, uh, we don't see any such uh, group phenomenon. Subjects continue with whatever phase one beliefs uh, they had. On these graphs, which I'm not going to comment uh, uh, in detail, you can just see that there are many more green arrows up, which corresponds to uh, in the exchange motivation treatment, which corresponds to people revising up their beliefs than there are uh, were, um, uh, uh, arrows pointing down. Conclusion, social learning or exchange of beliefs or communication of beliefs worsens bias on average. Okay? So it's the opposite of the wisdom of crowds, like you know, how, how many coins in this jar, if you put two people together, uh, their mean estimate is gonna be better than if they're individual. And if you put more people together, it gets better. Here, it's the opposite. You put them together, they get um, the over-optimism gets worse, especially for the people with low IQ. Why? Because counting coins in a jar is not like estimating your IQ. You care differently about one versus the other. Okay. Um, can somebody give me a time signal? Because I lost track again. Uh, you have three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Okay. All right. So I'll just mention and, and refer you to, um, to this uh, other recent paper. Uh, where people, um, uh, you know, propose solution to a, a very hard problem, which in fact doesn't have an optimal solution. All you can do is, is do better or worse, but never optimal. And we elicit beliefs about their performance, uh, either individual or when they compete in teams, okay? And the team proposes a solution. Uh, there's also a market condition where you can trade assets that, you know, that bet on your team or on the other team. And what they find again is, uh, is, uh, let's see, I didn't summarize it. Um, <clears throat> what they find again, sorry, I'll just, uh, I'll just state it, uh, is that in the condition when, uh, you know, we are competing in teams of six, we are. We tend to convince our. There is over optimism uh, as usual uh, in individual competition. I think I'm more likely to win the competition than than others. But when we talk, when it is groups, then the groups become even more optimistic. Okay? So in the group, presumably there's some people who are optimistic and others pessimistic. Just like in the previous experiment, optimism prevails in the end. Okay. Um, we can uh, uh, um, uh, extend the model to financial markets. Uh, I'm not gonna do that uh, here, but I'm going to uh, conclude. Um, I'm just gonna mention some recent um, papers that go back to this memory thing and basically show that people remember their investment successes much more their, in their investment failures. They remember uh, you know, uh, the assets that have gone up more than the assets that have come down in their portfolios. And this might be a channel, you know, towards investor over-optimism. And um, I'm going to skip that and just conclude with this other very nice paper, which is in the field is not an experiment um, and documents that even Wall Street insiders, uh, the people who should know and the people who were thought to know and have deceived others, in fact, largely deceived themselves uh, uh, about uh, the, the, what was going to happen to housing prices. So uh, the standard story is one of bad incentives uh, with insiders deceiving others. In this, uh, in this uh, study, they say, okay, what did these insiders actually believe and can we tell from their behaviors, from their actions? So what they did is they tracked down uh, 400 so-called securitization managers, insurers, investors. These are people who package these mortgage-backed securities and sell them and resell them and so on. 
they track them at a convention, and then they link them to, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, did these guys or, or women buy, uh, uh, when did, did they buy housing for themselves during the boom or during the, during the crash? Did they time the market right or did they time the market wrong? What can we tell about their beliefs concerning the bubble based on their own private housing transactions? And we're going to compare them to other equally sophisticated people, but with no stakes. And again, the stakes word is, is important uh, in the housing market, either equity analysts who have nothing to do with home building or lawyers who don't specialize in real estate law. And what you can see here, and uh, I think this will be my last graph, uh, this is the timing of the bubble uh, asset pr uh, housing prices in various uh, local markets and in the U.S. as a whole. The black line is, shows the housing purchases, uh, the purchases of a second home or, uh, you know, trading up for a bigger home of the securitizations agents, the, secu the equity analysts, and the lawyers. And what you can see is that these insiders, securitization agent, they basically bought at the peak. Um, and then um, and then, uh, uh, it, and then they, whereas the other ones, you know, stop buying much earlier. And this is about uh, divestiture. Uh, so selling rather than buying, you can see that the first ones to start buying are the uh, equity analysts, uh, followed by the lawyers, and then the last ones to buy and they're uh, to sell. Sorry, and they're reselling during the crash are the securitization insiders. And if you compute uh, you know, the return on their housing portfolios of these categories, you can see that the insiders actually did much worse than these other categories. So it does seem like you know, they may, maybe they had bad incentives, but they certainly had bad beliefs. They did believe, believe uh, that the housing uh, bubble would continue. Um, all right, so just takeaways, motivated beliefs and reasoning. So it can be explicit reasoning, it can be intuitive, it can be cognition, memory, etc. are ubiquitous. As Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, we know the telltale signs. We have seen them in the lab and in the field. Uh, many of them make them different from or recognizable from cold biases and heuristics but uh, the two are linked. It's because memory is imperfect that you can selectively forget, uh, for example, or it's because computation is imperfect that you can say, oh, I made an error. It just happens that this error you know, is self-serving. People trade off the costs and benefits of belief distortions. Both sides can be large. Uh, and this allows for experimental manipulation. Uh, maybe, um, it also allows for debiasing if we can get at the motivations that's maybe more effective than just you know uh, hitting people in the in the face with the truth which they don't want to know uh, and then when we go to social cognition at the group or the country level uh, these things can amplify uh, and in particular the private and the social costs or and benefits are very different okay and overall, I hope this talk has demonstrated the strong complementarities between theory, experiments, and empirics, and also of social sciences, economics, uh, psychology, political science, uh, and the like. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colin. This is a really a wonderful talk. Uh, now we uh, invite questions from the audience. Can I ask, uh, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. It's really um, very interesting. Uh, I just wonder whether we know much about uh, individual difference in this wishful thinking. Do we know like what kind of people tend to engage in this? And are those wishful thinking connected to their, for example, success or other behavior uh, traits? Do we know much about that? Or can you say something about that? Um... I'll tell you what, what I know about that, which you know may be a small subset of, of what there is to know. Um, so um, 
we know that optimists, uh, people who are optimists to a certain degree, um, but maybe not you know, excessively optimists, tend to um, be happier, uh, live longer, get more education, um, and, and in, in general have more uh, fruitful lives, which kind of suggests that maybe you know, there is some uh, functional value as well as hedonic value to optimistic beliefs. Surely there's a point beyond which it becomes, um, you know, uh, it becomes uh, detrimental, but I don't know that people have looked at that. Uh, the psychologists have scales of self-delusion and, and, and things like that. I don't know, but maybe some people uh, here do know, I don't know of, um, of studies that have, um, you know, correlated, uh, you know, these, 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 these optimism or delusion scales with uh, behavior in the experiments, although that probably uh, does exist, but none come to mind. Uh, but what, what uh, some of these experiments and others, including some, some um, in, in, in neuroscience or neuroeconomics show is that there are people who are, who are you know, uh, um, stably or, um, or uh, consistently, uh, yes, uh, you know, and engaging in this kind of motivated cognition. Uh, if, you, if you do it, you know, like for example, you know, if you do it on one question, you'll do it on others. Um, and uh, there might even seems to be different processes uh, involved in the brain, although that, that's beyond my, my competence. But um, so I think that there are, you know, um, motivated reasoning or motivated um, cognition types uh, to some extent. But uh, there's a lot of variation, and in particular, you know, if you change the stakes, as we have said before, uh, I think that probably swamps, or at least that's as, as important as you know some fixed propensity uh, that you may have. So our next question comes from Vilan. Vilan, would you like to ask your question? Roland, thanks for such a wonderful talk. Say, I'm wondering, right, the literature on cultural transmission, in some sense, or broadly speaking, also talks about belief, but the emphasis is on interper interpersonal interactions, such as those between children and parents. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether or not, say, you have any thought that you may share about the possible dialogue and integration between the literature of motivated condition, in particular, more recent work on social condition, and also literature on cultural transmission. Any thought? They will be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Um, I think to some extent, um, to some extent, I think these literatures are talking about the same thing. And, uh, you know, when you say that you give parents, give children certain values, are they preferences? Are they beliefs? Uh, it's kind of hard to to, uh, to, to draw a, a, a red line between the two. Uh, in terms of modeling approaches, it is true that a lot of literature on cultural transmission, even though it talks about beliefs to some extent, they model transmission of preferences, of tastes, <clears throat> uh, for uh, you know, tastes for effort or something like that. Whereas in, in the, the paper with Jean Thoreau, uh, we talk about, you know, beliefs in, you know, in whether effort pays or not, you know, in terms of getting your, your, your children to work, you know, giving them a taste for effort or giving them beliefs that effort pays is going to uh, have kind of similar effects, although the, the mechanisms, the deep mechanisms, I think, are different. Uh, so I think there could be a bit more um, integration between the two. Another place where you see that is the literature on identity. If you think about, uh, and since you mentioned, you know, cultural transmission, if you think about uh, Akerlof and Cranton and, 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 and others, Bézine, Berger, etc. Again, it's, it's, it's kind of interdependent preferences. Um, what I've tried or what we've tried to emphasize are interdependent beliefs. Uh, I think the two are complements. Uh, 
the 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 belief channel i think uh i i find personally interesting because it it you know it it, it points to particular uh mechanisms that might be involved in particular memory and so we can look at that um specifically and in, in some cases um uh, narratives is another one uh stories uh, but I think I think they're very they're very complementary, and some of their results are uh, not all, but some of the results have similar flavors, such as you know history dependence and multiple equilibrium. Uh, the welfare implications uh, might be uh, somewhat different. Um, I think. So the next question is from Lata. Thank you, Roland, for such a nice talk. It was a very nice and comprehensive talk about uh, uh, motivated beliefs, both at the individual and at the group level. I had a question about a comment that you had close to the end of the talk, where you say that information, um, changing information or giving information or information nudges may not really um, improve outcomes in, in the group uh, decision-making context. Do you have any comments on why you um, think so? And also, what are the other aspects that can help in, in this kind of a context? Um, so I think, I think um, giving information um, may, may not help in the individual context, you know, if the individual wants to stick to certain beliefs. Uh, and um, and maybe even less in the in the in the group context. Um, that that I don't know that there is that much wor empirical work on. Um, but uh, we saw, for example, that you know in this experiment, at least it was it was a pair of people or it was a group of people working on a task. It seems like you know when some people come in with positive uh views or signals or you know priors or you know assessments let me put it that way and others come in with negative ones it seems like you know convergence is more in the direction of the positive ones um, so if you were to give some relatively ambiguous you know not completely clear-cut signal to a group some people might view it as good news other people might view it as uh, a warning signal my conjecture, but I don't know uh, of, a, of, a, of a good study on that, is that uh, you know there would be a, a tendency to, to for the for the former to prevail. Um, and certainly, if we see if we look outside of the world, and now this is you know no, no more uh, this is just casual empiricism. Uh, we see certainly um, you know that the most extreme belief distortions, conspiracy theories, and the like. Uh, are really collected, you know, you need a group to sustain them uh, in some sense. Uh, and, and once you have that group, it can be extremely re resistant to, to any kind of evidence. Um, and through various mechanisms, anybody who dissents, you know, is going to be uh, called a traitor, is going to be ostracized, kicked out, and so on. And so um, groups, I guess, have, have ways of... Um, <laughs> have ways of uh, sustaining beliefs uh, uh, in a more stronger and more stable way than, than individuals. And if you think about you know, another realm or religion, you know, nobody has their own religion. Uh, it's, 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 it's always a collective belief, collectively sustained belief. Um, yeah. So the next question is from Paul. Oh, thank you for your talk, uh, Roland. Uh, I, I was thinking about um, vote compass. The, oh, the vote, uh, vote compass. There's a a, a, a a tool called vote compass where uh, people ask a, 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 a response to quite a long um, survey about their political beliefs. And the consequence of that is that it then actually positions them, say, close to a particular party. 
and it then displays that information for you on a um, two-dimensional matrix. Uh, do, do those sorts of tools then, from your research, do those sorts of tools then affect the way people then behave in the future? So uh, as a result of, say, for example, answering that question, you may have historically voted towards the right, but when you answer the questions, it actually positions you to the left. Are you then more likely to change your voting pattern based on supposedly then real, real data? Uh, is it likely to shift you more from the right to the left or vice versa? Uh, it seems to me that the, the work you've done here could be central to the, um, the, the usefulness of such tools. I, I confess that I don't know uh, th this uh, this uh, tool or or this uh, this design. Uh, so so what exactly does it? Uh, so this what is, information does it provide me with that I didn't have before? So this tool is about political beliefs. It's called mm -hmm. Vote Compass. It's not used just only in Australia. It's used throughout the world. So it's a tool where, uh, based on um, an upcoming election, that various political parties then position themselves in a, in, in a two-dimensional grid. Uh, and you then respond to a questionnaire based on that, which, and it's quite a detailed questionnaire of a dozen or more questions to try and then position yourself relative to the political parties. So what it does is it, it elicits from you um, the difference between your perhaps your historical beliefs and your actual values and the, the difference between the two, which should in, uh, in a rational world switch your thinking from your historical irrational uh, beliefs towards a more rational view. So it seems in theory a, a, a useful tool, but I was wondering whether or not from your research, it, it actually does any good, whether people will actually change their mind or will they, they'll stick with yeah. their wishful thinking of voting as they always have done. Does that help? So, so, so if I understand correctly, you know, and maybe I've always um, been, uh, whatever uh voting for this party and i think you know and that's my identity and then i see in this two-dimensional matrix exactly where they are on issues a and b or x and y and then you ask me to think carefully where i am on issues x and y and then i see that i'm actually far from from that uh and so i might change my my vote if, if, if i understand that's the mechanism um so I think for you know for 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 people again who don't have large identity or emotional stakes in in a particular party or ideology, um, that's probably a useful exercise and and that can move them somewhat. For um, those who you know who are really into motivated beliefs uh i i'm kind of skeptical uh let's take an example uh you know the uh, um the 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 republican right uh, used to be very anti-communist and anti-soviet okay now a significant fraction of them is aligned with putin but uh that doesn't deter, uh, you know, they're faithful from following them into alignment with Putin. Um, so uh, I, I, I think, so I guess it would be, a, a, you're almost suggesting an experiment here, uh, which uh, I don't know if it has been run, but, but it sounds like there's a good tool to run that experiment. Uh, of course, I think you would probably get, well, I don't know if you get selected subjects, uh, You'd, ha you'd have to, to, to be meaningful, that experiment would have to be representative, not just, uh, you know, income and, and education, et cetera, but, but all political views, including, including uh, the, the most distorted and possibly conspiratorial ones. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, if somebody is into QAnon, I don't think that that matrix is going to do very much for them. Uh, thank, thank you. I mean, the, the actual questionnaire is multidimensional, so it isn't, uh, but, but thank oh, you very much. Just, oh, it's not just two dimensional. Okay, great. So the, the, it, it, the positioning is um, just relative to the other parties, but the question mm -hmm. is, is really quite sophisticated. So thank you for your thoughts anyway. Thank you. So the next question is from Mallory. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, so I guess my question might be a little related to what Lada asked, which is in general for either individuals or groups, you know, what do we do about this? Because there are, you know, negative internalities if you, you know, you really believe that or you refuse to believe that you have a uh, bad health uh, on a certain dimension and you know, you can't update that belief for externalities if your behaviors affect others. And I mean, I think it's clear from the evidence that, you know, providing information doesn't help. And then I actually have a paper that basically shows that, you know, if people are not sleeping enough, you give them incentives to sleep, they sleep more unless they're overconfident about their uh, sleep patterns, right? So that overconfidence actually prevents them from responding positively to the incentives in the way that, you know, other groups do. So, so, you know, okay, incentives probably don't work. Uh, that's one data point, but like information doesn't work. What do we do? Well, I think, um, so, so, so I, I certainly don't have a magic bullet and nobody has a magic bullet. I think different things will, will work for different people. Uh, and there are people for whom nothing will work, uh, you know, for, for certain beliefs. Um, I think for health, um, you know, long-term education and uh, to some, you know, think about smoking, for example, you know, so, so, so people, I, I don't think there are many people anymore who, who think that uh, smoking doesn't involve risk, although they probably, uh, the smokers probably still underestimate the risks. Um, so, you know, I would say, so, you know, some information, uh, maybe some incentives, uh, or in fact, um, correcting some bad incentives. Uh, if, if, when I refer, for example, to the housing crisis and these insiders, you know, their, um, their um, material financial incentives where, you know, and their career incentives uh, were extremely skewed uh, towards making the continuation of uh, uh, house price rises an extremely desirable state of the world. Um, and so if, if we make that state of the world and, you know, an infinitely desirable state for you and uh, the other state of the world uh, a disaster, then you're gonna think that, you know, the, the good state's gonna happen. So now if I change your remuneration and I make it less skewed, um, <clears throat> you have less to gain, you know, in, 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 in thinking that the good state's gonna realize and less to lose in realizing or in, facing the, the likelihood that the other state might realize. So I think correcting incentives, uh, which you know you might want to do anyway because of moral hazard, I think this, there might be a double um, a double dividend here in that you will also correct the beliefs. And finally, and this might you know not be easy to do to, to the to the you know if you can change the motivations uh, or some of these motivations, um, that can be uh, helpful too. Sometimes people want to, you know, feel good about themselves in some dimension because life isn't going very well in some other dimension. So economically, I, I, I you know, it's hard for me to to not realize that I'm at the towards the bottom of the, etc. So what I do, I will convince myself that I'm morally superior, uh, and. Um, and I will, you know, take actions uh, to demonstrate to others and to myself that I'm morally superior along some dimension. Well, to, to the extent that you can ameliorate the, the need for that, for that belief in moral superiority uh, by making the material conditions better, then, then you can, again, you know, have a multiplier effect. But, um, 
So the 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 work doesn't um, certainly doesn't provide a, a a magic bullet or one size fits all thing. It it just points at different things that you might do. Uh, other than uh, throw information at people, maybe that's the first thing that you should do. Is throw, probably is, is you know is, is, is throw information, educate people, or um, and, and then if it doesn't work, then you know that's a sign that the beliefs might be motivated, not just innocent mistakes, and then you might want to try these other mechanisms. So next is Jingjing Jing with a question. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this um, brilliant lecture. I really enjoyed it. And I'm also, yeah, I'm also particularly interested in group thinking because I actually do research on group dynamics and decision making. Mm. And I'm wondering um, whether there are studies that try to disentangle two types of effects because once you put people into groups, um, the positive thing is that you may have like, patient sequential social learning. You can learn from each other and that could actually um, reduce judgment errors. But on the other hand, you may have social norm, you may, you may have group pressure that will actually uh, increase judgment errors. So I don't know whether there are studies, uh, existing studies that can disentangle those two or you have mechanism try to enhance one and then minimize the other. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there is a literature which uh, I know only a little bit about, about, you know, how groups may make some decisions differently from individuals. For example, are they more risk averse or less risk averse? Um, um, and, uh, and then, of course, as you mentioned, social norms and social pressure. Now here, the, the here I would say an easy fix for that is anonymity. Okay, if 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 you you know the or or uh, if, if this it's not always the case that you can be anonymous because sometimes you have to explain your position. The issue is complex, and once you've explained it, I know you know what you think and so on and, and what your preferences are. But when when it can be made anonymous. Uh, at least you take away an important part of the social pressure and reputational elements. Um, and, uh, you know, on the, then, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be an empirical issue. And again, uh, I think that, you know, whether there are emotional and broadly defined stakes involved or not is going to make a big difference. So, you know, counting the coins in a jar, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no stake here except getting it right, and so the group is going, definitely going to be better. Uh, are we in a, in a, are you and I in, in is our group uh, that we're in uh, intellectually superior or morally superior to the other group? Uh, there, I think uh, you're likely to get what I call the opposite of the wisdom of crowds. Uh, all right, thank you very much. You're welcome. The next question comes from Wei. Uh, okay, so uh, um, hi, Professor Binabo. Thank you for the inspiring lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we are excited to see the motivated beliefs literature is uh, booming in recent years. And uh, uh, I want to ask, uh, in most models, the endogenization of the motivated beliefs uh, is uh, purely strategic, while in reality, the formation of uh, motivated beliefs, uh, um, as well as a uh, 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 cognitive bias, is called for, is um, sometimes not a conscious decision, but uh, more like a long-run habituation in a in a Darwinian sense. So this may be a potential challenge to really test the theories in experiments. So so we see. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, many experiments and empirics, they reported the existence of uh, motivated beliefs in different scenarios, rather than really testing the causality or, or the motivated part implied by the theory. So I just wonder if you um, have any suggestions on digging deeper towards uh, testing the motivated part of the motivated beliefs. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, so I, 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 I read two questions in your question. The first one is um, whether these belief distortions are conscious and even strategic, you know, with respect to my future selves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I would say they don't have to be, they can be unconscious. Uh, um, the, the formalism that we take is, you know, is that of maximization uh, of, of utility that has beliefs in it. And, and so that, that's going to make it look strategic, et cetera. But really, it's just like maximizing over apples and oranges. Uh, nobody, you know, sets up a Lagrangian. This just describes a tendency towards apples or oranges, which responds to the price of apples and oranges. And similarly, this just describes a tendency towards either reassuring, pleasant, or functional, uh, useful beliefs that responds to how pleasant or unpleasant or useful or unuseful various beliefs are. It doesn't have to be uh, conscious uh, um, or, you know, uh, and, and probably isn't uh, completely, you know, it probably, in some sense, the less conscious it is, uh, the, the better it works. Uh, because if I, if I really decide that I want to forget something, then probably I'm not going to forget it. Uh, so that's part one. Um, and, and, and more generally, I think, you know, models of, of um, you know, of, of equilibrium where people maximize can often, the outcome can also often be achieved through some kind of evolutionary model where people just adapt in the direction of, of you know, what a fitness, some kind of fitness. Um, so, so, so I think that every, the two approaches here are compatible. It's a little bit like preferences versus beliefs. Uh, they emphasize different things. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question uh, was about getting at the motivations. Here, I would say, um, I think these, uh, so some of these papers that I have, uh, empirical papers, experiment, right, get at the motivations rather well. I mean, we, can't, we cannot see in the, inside people's heads, but, um, but you know, the, 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 I think the, the, the motivation for thinking, you know, what, what could be the, what would I say? The motivation for thinking that you're smart or attractive, or uh, or that your political beliefs are, you know, are the right ones, and so on, or that your group is the smarter one, seem pretty clear. Um, what uh, what one can do potentially again is is you know is is varying. Um, is varying uh, the, the intensity or even the sign of these motivations. So for example, there's a nice paper, which I didn't cite because I didn't have time by, um, I think it's Gary Charnas and Joel van der Vele and, and some other co-author where um, people are going to be, um, and maybe I'm confusing two papers, but let's say let's say you're going to play a game, um, or you're going to um, be in in an interview, okay, where you have to convince the other person that you are smart uh, or that you are very smart. And I didn't mention it very. Uh, I mentioned only very briefly, but that's another reason. That's another possible motive for distorting your beliefs. You're more convincing to others if you really believe it. Believe it yourself. And so <clears throat> you can. Um, so the, this paper or these two papers uh, uh, lumping together uh, show that if the situation is one in which I have strong incentives to to appear strong, uh, I will convince myself that I'm strong. Uh, and if I have, if the if the game, uh, the interaction that comes afterward is one where I don't have this, in this incentive to convince the other that I'm strong or smart, etc., 
then I will not convince myself uh, as much uh, or, or at all. Okay, so, so the, the thinking through the theory gives us a way of, 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 um, of I think, uh, going in the direction where you want, which is say, okay, we've, we, we, we have some strong intuitions as to what might be the motivations, the type of beliefs that people like or not. And then if we want to test that, well, then let's, um, let's uh, you know, let's make either the costs of self-deception bigger or smaller. Uh, in general, that doesn't work too well. People don't respond a lot to that. Or let's make the, you know, the benefits of self-deception uh, different or even go in different directions. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that's what the literature uh, is, is trying to do. Uh, I'm trying to think of other papers. Um, right. So, so, so I guess once you have identified a potential motivation, I think it's you know the experimenter in some cases can can amplify the stakes uh, or dampen the stakes uh, in thinking that you know the state is is uh, is theta versus theta prime. And then uh, if that, if we see such a response, it tells us that yes, you have, you know, that's the right uh, motivation that you have identified. Thank you very much. So Xiao Jian is next. Hi, hold on. <clears throat> I have actually a related question to Wei's uh, question about the motivation part of motivated belief. Uh, so in the beginning of this lecture, you mentioned that it can be either psychological reason or functional reason for motivated beliefs, right? So I totally understand the functional part uh, from evolutionary perspective or adaptive uh, perspective. I'm just wondering how powerful uh, the psychological reason is in terms of uh, explanation. I mean, in principle, um, you can explain any behavior bias or cognitive biases by adding some special component uh, in the in the domain of the preference, right? So basically, we can explain anything by assuming some special preference. Um, but nature sometimes doesn't care what we really like; they only select the right feature that uh, fit into the environment, right? So, I, I, so my question is about your view of these two reasons: one is psychological or hedonic; the other is uh, functional yeah. reason. Yeah. So I, I'm curious about your I judgment. Think yeah, I think I mean it's it's good. It, I find it useful to have that um, to distinguish the two cases. Though I I would say that the functional is also psychological, right? So if you think about who who it was who who mentioned believe was it, what is in the line of your needs, so that the, your feet are nerved to its own accomplishment, you know that was a psychologist, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and. Um, Right, so he was describing, you know, some some psychological processes which we can formalize as, you know, uh, uh, trying to overcome some some time inconsistency or some hyperbolic uh, problem. But you know, that is itself a psychological problem. Right? Why is it that I can't get myself to do what I want to do? That's itself a psychological problem. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't make that distinction that sharp. Now, in terms of um, evolution, uh, um, so I, I, I that's not something I know a whole lot about, but but I think it it could be uh, there could be two things. Uh, so if I mean, there's this huge debate, you know, about um, is it is it is it the gene, is it the individual, or is there something like cultural evolution at the level of of, of, of groups and so on? If uh, we think that uh, some over optimism can be good at the at the group level, maybe the, the small group level, you know, that you're gonna uh, be more adventurous, you're gonna fight harder, and so on then um, the source of it um, doesn't um, 
doesn't really matter in some sense, right? So if it just makes you happy to be over optimistic, well, that's good for me uh, uh, because you're going to, you know, contribute public goods and so on. And secondly, uh, I I wonder, you know, I I wonder what how we can rationalize in an evolutionary uh, uh, in a purely narrow functional evolutionary way, the fact that people, for example, like to go to movies, okay, uh, like to go to movies that make them laugh, okay, what, what is it, how, how is it good for fitness? I, I don't quite see how it's good for fitness. I can see how it's good for utility, but not so much for fitness. Uh, so uh, it could be that, um, yeah, not everything is for fitness, but, but I'm out of my domain of competence here when we talk about evolution. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Holland. Um, I think we are uh, running out of time. Right? So uh, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture, uh, especially in your uh, Paris time. It's now in the midnight. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really hope that we can have you uh, to visit Australia in person uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all, and, and thank, thank you for you. inviting me. Yeah. Great to see you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.